Good evening, everyone. My name is Maureen Wilson. I am the counselor for Ward 1 in the city of Hamilton. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. It's a beautiful night here in Kirkendall. So thanks for joining us. We're here to talk about um, the changes that will be coming um, to uh, Aberdeen and, and um, we'll be putting them in context as a continuum of change that has uh, been active in the city for um, and in the community in terms of uh, part of a, a discussion since uh, well before my time um, that predates uh, 2015 at least. So before I do that, I thought I'd just set out the roadmap for the evening. We have an hour and I know you don't particularly want to hear as much from me, but um, our agenda will be the following. Um, I will be giving some introductions in a moment. Then I'm going to turn to Stephanie. Many of you have met Steph. She um, works with me in the Ward 1 office. She's um, sort of behind the curtain. Um, we have to do everything online, of course. It's not ideal, but uh, such as the world of COVID. She'll be sort of setting out the rules of engagement and how the evening is going to operate in terms of questions and answers and how that all works. Um, then it's back to me for just a, a few more contextual remarks for introduction. And then I'm going to be turning um, to Mr. Ferguson, who I will introduce in a minute. Um, he's going to give us a brief chronology of some of the actions that the city has been taking with respect to Aberdeen in an effort to make it safer for all users. Um, then we'll have a moderated Q&A with Steph at the helm, and then I'll wrap it up with some closing remarks. So, um, in that order, uh, joining me tonight um, are a few um, really terrific people. Um, Edward Soldo is the Director of Transportation Operations and Maintenance. Um, Mike Field is our Manager of Transportation Operations. Um, David Ferguson, our Superintendent of Roadway Safety. And Mushfiq Rahman, who is the Senior Project Management Manager of traffic engineering. So thank you all very much for, for joining um, this Ward 1 discussion and particularly this Kirkendale discussion tonight. I'm going to very quickly hand it over to Stephanie and she's going to set out how this is going to work tonight and then it, it's back to me. Steph? Okay. Thanks Maureen. Just pulling up on the screen. Um, so tonight, uh, Q&A, when it's time for Q&A, we're gonna ask you to do the following, which is to uh, go to the bottom of your screen and you will see a Q&A icon. Uh, click on that icon. That will allow you to add questions. Um, any question you want, feel free to put it in there. Uh, you type it in the open field and hit enter. After that, um, there's the ability to upvote questions. So some people, rather than ask, um, some questions uh, over and over again, you may see a question that interests you. So the idea is to upvote the question for the most relevant question. So you'll click on the thumbs up icon and that will move those questions with the most likes to the top. Again, helping that the most relevant questions are, are asked. Um, that is about it for how that will work. Um, I will not be looking to the chat box for questions. I got to be honest, I have the attention span of a gnat. I really need to concentrate on one side of the page. So I'm just going to stick to the, the Q&A um, to look for the questions. And that is it. That's, that's the technical part. Back to you. Okay, thank you, Steph. Okay, so I'm just getting oriented on my screen here. Okay. Um, so why are we here tonight? We're here to uh, discuss the changes that were, will be forthcoming um, to, to Aberdeen and to put them in context, uh, these changes are um, um, a story map, if you will, of, of, uh, of efforts and actions that have been taken um, since the about 2015, 2017, um, incremental changes to try and address um, an outstanding a safety issue for all users, uh, starting with uh, pedestrians, um, and put them in the context of what is some of our, our city pol policies that have been deliberated publicly and debated and have been open for consultation. And I'm speaking, of course, specifically to the big one, which is Vision Zero, which I'm sure most of you know about. I believe it started in Sweden 
and at the time it was um, quite quite something. It is very much the norm now as uh, cities across uh, the world and including North America are aiming to address some conditions uh, that were not did not make for a safe environment for all users. So the goal is to have zero fatalities and injuries uh, for all users. And it puts a pedestrian as the most vulnerable user, which of course they are. Um, and and that, is a, uh, corp that is a city policy. And it's also for this council, part of our, um, uh, one of our priorities. And of course mine, which I campaigned on during the last 2000 and, uh, during the last municipal election in 2018. Um, so uh, the changes that are going to be forthcoming on Aberdeen are, are part of that continuous improvement, evaluation, what's working, uh, what's outstanding, um, and we'll get to those. So uh, right now, um, as part of that, I would like to introduce um, David Ferguson. As I mentioned, he is the superintendent of uh, roadway safety, very familiar with Aberdeen, um, has had carriage of this file for, for many years, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful that he's here with, uh, with us tonight. So David is going to uh, give a little bit of um, an overview of all these various actions and to put, uh, put it out almost in a story map for us. So David. Thank you, Councillor. Thank Good you. Evening, everybody. Uh, Stephanie, you got my presentation there? Yep, just. Yep, it's up. Perfect. <clears throat> yes, if you want to switch to the next page. There we go. So just uh, just wanted to provide some background. I know uh, over the years I've, I've had a number of questions sort of around Aberdeen. Where does it come from and the issues? So back in 2015, the Kirkendall Association uh, undertook a review of Aberdeen. Um, and this was part of the Ward 1 participatory budget uh, that at the time was conducted by uh, Councillor uh, Aidan Johnson. <clears throat> and then from that, in December of that same year, uh, he brought forward a motion to GIC uh, for a full review of Aberdeen uh, from Queen to Longwood with a focus on safety and operations, as well as looking at it through the lens of um, Vision Zero, as well as complete streets. Mm. <clears throat> Subsequent to that, or after that, we had in March our, our first report uh, to Public Works Committee in 2017, uh, identifying some interim safety measures. And then uh, it was on our outstanding business list and therefore we uh, provided a follow-up uh, update report in June 17, uh, or on June 17, 2019 Public Works Committee. Next slide. There we go. So this is just a list of some of the things that uh, have been recommended and uh, approved by council and of course uh, implemented. So the first item is uh, we installed a intersection uh, pedestrian signal at Aberdeen and Cottage. Uh, this was one of the items that was identified in the Kirkendall report um, in terms of lack of pedestrian crossings in that area. Second item was uh, a narrowing of the right turn channelized island uh, as well as we just recently removed the yield signs and have installed stop signs at that location which we will be doing some additional enhancements with. Um, we've also undertaken a we undertook a review of the intersection of Aberdeen and Queen and specifically with a focus on the southbound left turn lane we identified a collision pattern uh, as a result of uh, issues there. Uh, so we had that southbound left turn lane and, and through that we've actually been able to, uh, I think in the 2019 statistics, I believe we were able to reduce the collision patterns there by 50%. Um, some additional things, lane modification at Aberdeen and Dundurn and changes to the signal phasing and operation. Uh, we modified the peak hour parking restrictions only. Um, previously they were uh, 
about seven to six, I believe, uh, Monday to Saturday. So we uh, modified those uh, to be peak hour only. Uh, we added a pedestrian lead phase at Dundurn. Uh, we did have a uh, pedestrian collision issue uh, identified at that location and uh, pedestrian injuries uh, are one of our focus areas in Vision Zero uh, because of the high percentages of injuries that occur with a pedestrian being involved uh, in a collision. We also added uh, right turn on red restrictions. Uh, we've increased uh, or enhanced uh, crosswalks with ladder crosswalks uh, throughout the corridor. Uh, we added a flashing 40 during school hours and we have PED countdown signals at the intersections of Dundurn and at Queen. Next. <clears throat> so this is uh, sort of what's, I guess, brought us here tonight is uh, I think one of the main focuses. So this is the current uh, restrictions or parking regulations, stopping regulations that are along Aberdeen. Uh, and be, this is between Queen and Dundurn. Uh, the yellow salt line is, is no stopping. Uh, the area with the red dashed, uh, primarily on that north side, uh, so they have no parking, um, it's still 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. The no stopping has changed from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. So that's one change. And then on the uh, south side, we have uh, no stopping and no parking uh, regulations. Go ahead, Steph. And so this is also wanted to show the current uh, restrictions uh, west of Dundurn. So these aren't going to change. Uh, these are going to stay in place. Um, and so there, there'll be no change in this area at this time. Next one, Steph. And so this is uh, now showing essentially what um, is being proposed. Uh, I've been working with our parking uh, department or division to finalize the details and they're still, still working on this, but this is pretty much what it's going to look like. So the, the green areas will be uh, either no stopping or no parking restrictions. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of them are at um, the intersections as well as they will be at bus stops. <clears throat> and this will be of course to open up uh, the sight lines at those intersections. Um, one thing to note, especially at, uh, at uh, Dundurn, I know uh, some current concerns were brought forward about Dundurn and uh, potential uh, impacts there. That location will not change from what you see today. So it'll continue to be the two uh, westbound lanes with the left turn lane there. Uh, that will remain. So as people are, are heading west uh, from Queen, uh, as they begin to approach uh, the intersection, it'll open back up to two lanes. The other thing to consider is, <clears throat> even though we, we've identified these yellow areas where there's potential for parking, it stays as a, as a four lane roadway. It only really becomes two lanes if people are actually parked in the curb lanes on either side of the roadway. If nobody's parked there, it'll operate as two lanes in each direction. Um, and that's about it. That's, that's what's brought us here and uh, I'll hand it back to Councillor Wilson. Sorry, Dave, can, can you um, maybe as a refresher go over the um, council approved recommendations that kind of all led to this? Yeah, um, just trying to think what they all were. I don't think I have them right in front of me. Um, but in each of those uh, reports that were submitted uh, to Public Works Committee and then approved by Council, um, each of the items that were implemented um, was a recommendation by staff to Council and subsequently approved. Um, just another note, in terms of the Kirkendall report, um, they had a number of, of items listed 
uh, that staff did review and I believe mm-hmm. was reported on the 2017 report. Yep. Um, and I, I'd say about maybe 50% of, of the requests uh, staff did not support. Um, there were various things that they were looking for, uh, but really it, it requires something of a bigger plan in terms of almost reconstruction to be able to accommodate some of those requests. So we're working based on uh, the principles of the Vision Zero, uh, the complete street model, um, and working within the existing right of way. Mm-hmm. So those the basket of changes that um, were approved in June of last year, um, if, if I may, and um, timing modifications to the intersection of Aberdeen and Dundurn to implement a pedestrian lead phase for pedestrians crossing on the east side, going north to south, uh, a no right turn on red that would be installed in the morning hours to coincide when the crossing guard is there because of... Um, Uh, years of conflict and uh, working under the principles of vision vision zero staff are recommended permitting parking on both north and south sides of Aberdeen between Queen and Dundurn and uh, flashing 40 uh, along Aberdeen from Queen to Longwood during school arrival and dismissal hours to be implemented. Um, So uh, this this attention to Aberdeen, we're actually um, building on a really fine work um, and uh, long advocacy um, of the experience in the Durand neighborhood, uh, just east of Queen, between um, Queen and Bay, uh, which is of course the key connector uh, from the mountain access to the downtown, which for years suffered from high speeds and cut through traffic. And the Durand Neighborhood Association mounted a, a pretty um, a good defense and successfully sought and achieved narrowing of that part of Aberdeen permanently uh, from two one lanes uh, down to one one-way lane with permanent bump outs along the way. And of course, a big bump out at Bay and Aberdeen. And then of course, the, the concrete median, which exists at James South and Aberdeen Um, which together were quite successful um, in uh, addressing some longstanding safety issues having to do with uh, high speeds and just making for an unpleasant environment. So we're wishing to carry on uh, that same attention to uh, safety uh, for the neighborhood as a whole with these these changes. Um, What else may I add before we open it up? Um, I think that's about all. I I know some of the folks have uh, sent in questions in advance. I hope we answered some of those. I I know um, I always try and conduct a a meeting uh, to be as inclusive as possible because we have many families and individuals who have moved into Kirkendall who may not have that that knowledge. And I, I, I want them to feel um, included and active and to bring them up to speed on what's been going on. I also know that we all live busy lives and sometimes um, uh, we, we can't be active in all of the civic engagements and, and uh, keep track of what's going on. So I think that history that David has provided is really important as well. So I hope that was helpful. Um, so I think it might be appropriate. I'm going to turn to, to Mike or David or Edward if there was anything they wish to add before we get into the Q&A or Mushfiq, I beg your pardon. I don't hear anything. So I think um, one of the recommendations related to um, implementing the changes and then reporting back to Public Works Committee within mm-hmm. six months is an important one. Um, and that's the period of time when we're going to be reviewing the uh, and evaluating the effectiveness of uh, all the measures all combined and uh, to see if they um, have met the the objectives that we wanted them wanted them to and if we need to make any alterations to the plan so that's another um, important piece that we should just point out yeah thank you uh, Mike a really important piece um, so that this will be um, monitored and continuously assessed 
by our professionals in the transportation operation and maintenance. And I, of course, will be listening to all of you, um, gaining the feedback um, and uh, walking the walk around that neighborhood as I do all the time. So in combination, moving to a, a better place for, for all users. And that's the goal. Um, the goal is um, to make Kirkendall even better. A couple other points I would like to make is, um, as you know, Kirkendall, or you may not know this, has uh, the second uh, largest number of speed bumps in all of Hamilton. I think we're at 49 and Ward 2 maybe at 50 or 51. So uh, I know there has been an, an express concern about uh, what this might do to, to generate, um, some of us call it rat running or cut through traffic. We have that right now. And in fact, in the Ward 1 office, it, it might be the number one uh, complaint. Um, and so the objective here is to look at the neighborhood as a whole um, and to address the issue of uh, the principle and practice of induced demand. So traffic engineers have known about induced demand since the 1960s. It's just taken uh, politicians a lot longer to catch up. So um, in fact, traffic is not like water that finds its way into crooks and crannies. Traffic is, um, in terms of the elements, it's a gas. Traffic will fill up whatever space you provide it. So if you provide more lanes, traffic, they're going to fill those lanes up. So when um, we, we add more lanes, it looks like it's addressing a congestion issue for a while, and then all of a sudden you find out, boy, it's, it's just as busy, and that's because they, they're a magnet. It's a gas. Um, and what we're trying to do is, with the conversion of Queen Street, um, which is uh, will be completed at some point this month, um, uh, we will be providing those who are traveling in a north-south direction um, an opportunity to either turn, if you're coming north, left onto Aberdeen, uh, going straight, if that's your destination, um, and or turning uh, west on onto Aberdeen. So we're, we're trying to uh, lessen the load, if you will, throughout all of Kirkendale um, with these basket of changes that always work like peas and carrots together. You can never do anything in isolation because um, it just doesn't work that way. So you've heard enough about me, uh, from me rather, and what I'd like to do is uh, go to Steph and see if uh, she can um, maybe read some of these questions out and we'll try our very best to respond. Okay. Mark, the first question up is uh, from Mark. The mm -hmm. road handles 20,000 vehicles per weekday now. How do you propose to manage the overcapacity? Okay. Um, I will take that. I'm not a professional engineer, uh, but one of the points that I have been making continuously in the communication through um, via all of our platforms is in fact um, it's not at capacity in fact um, there are um, many examples of major arterial Aberdeen is a minor arterial that in fact uh, carry a greater volume of traffic and they are two lanes so I can Russo is of course one Wilson in Ancaster is another uh, Kenilworth which um, under the leadership of Sam Marula in partnership with the Mountain Councillor provided for parking on both sides of those um, that four lane um, again it carries overall a greater capacity so um, Aberdeen right now um, has the ability uh, to move uh, to fewer lanes um, if we're using others as an example and the other one of course uh, being Governor's Road so thank you next okay. no uh, is there anybody from traffic management that oh, wants yeah. to participate in that answering that question no takers good all right Graham is asking how are cyclists being accommodated I can try and um, answer that so Aberdeen itself was never identified um, in the city's cycling master plan um, however, there is work underway right now with a consultant on a multimodal um, study for Ward 1, which seeks to identify and maximize and provide for uh, really key connections um, 
that may not exist right now in Ward 1 to facilitate um, a safer and more efficient and effective uh, whether it be a pedestrian or a cycling um, experience. Um, I'm hoping that that work will be concluded by spring and then the implementation can begin thereafter. Next. Thank you. Rhoda is asking, what are you going to do to avoid rat racing on streets where you can't put no left turn signs? Um, I'll, I'll hand that over to the professional engineers, but as, as Mike noted in his comments, um, like all of the um, initiatives that have taken place, the initiatives that have uh, taken place, um, it is a pilot, so uh, they'll be evaluating them um, continuously. So I will hand it over to the engineers to speak to that one. I'll take that, uh, Councillor. So uh, staff have um, generated a number of traffic studies. So once uh, this was originally approved uh, and prior to COVID hitting, um, traffic staff did undertake a number of uh, traffic counts, so turning movement counts at various intersections. Uh, we've been conduct we conducted, um, we call them uh, ATR counts, which is uh, mid-block speed and volume uh, counts. We collect that data, as well as we, we've undertaken um, speed and delay studies uh, that started from actually the top of the hill, uh, the Queen Street Hill uh, at Fennel, uh, and all the way out to uh, the Highway 403. Once these changes are Im implemented, we will be conducting those studies again. Uh, I suspect uh, probably in April, maybe, uh, we will start doing those studies, um, as well as we will be undertaking observations both from the roadway safety group, as well as our traffic signal systems group. Uh, we'll, we will be monitoring uh, the locations. If we identify, I know one of the concerns is, you know, vehicles may divert into neighborhoods. If we identify that that's occurring, we will undertake a, uh, it's called a cut through study. Uh, we'll have staff placed throughout the neighborhood. Uh, we record license plate information and then we, we track where a person enters and where a person exits. Uh, and then we can look at potential countermeasures uh, to be implemented if need be. Uh, Alex is asking, regarding what, is, what was now outlined by David, so David, during your presentation previously, um, should residents presume that these actions have not worked and that more needs to be done now? As, so those initial, uh, that initial grouping of items that you show that ha have been done, uh, should we presume that that was not enough and this is why we're looking for more, more calming opportunities now? So, I mean, one of the things that you find with studies and implementing collision countermeasures <clears throat> you really need to have uh, a period of time to go and determine whether or not they actually work. So, you know, for example, I, I mentioned about the Queen Street uh, Aberdeen changes uh, that we implemented. We were able to identify a change there uh, quite quickly. And so just for example, uh, between 2014 uh, and 2018, uh, there was between 14 and 18 collisions uh, occurring each year at that intersection. In 2019, that number went down to eight. So now there was also a lower number in 2017. So we want to monitor things over a period of time to determine what the actual impact is based on the changes. So I, I would say the changes that have been made to date have, have been positive. Um, but there's still area for improvement. And as we're working under uh, the Vision Zero Action Plan, um, as well as Complete Streets, you know, we continue to work towards uh, zero injuries and fatalities. The, the other thing that I'll add as well is that um, the removal of the parking restrictions is all contained within the same uh, council approved recommendations. So those all together, uh, what 
those that's what was approved um, not uh, not some um, implementation of some things and not others they are all done at the same time so that, that's another uh, consideration related to that uh, question uh, in the meantime we will go to Randy's question about and this relates to cycling both um, uh, Randy and Jeff uh, have asked uh, why parking is the better consideration uh, to act as a protected lane rather than cycling being a better way to help to calm traffic and protect the pedestrian. Um, David or Mike? Sorry, Steph, can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, okay. If there is a demand for parking on Aberdeen, is there a demand on parking in Aberdeen or would protected bicycle lanes be better traffic calming measures? And part B to that is, well, this person is in 100% in favor of reducing speed and volume on Aberdeen. They're wondering why more people would park there than um, just because they can. And at the same time, is it is an abysmal route for cyclists. If a road is an arterial, it should be a preferred route for cyclists and pedestrians too. And protected bike lanes should be more effective way of reducing volume and traffic. So basically, yeah. why mm. did you go with parking instead of adding bike protected bike lanes to help protect so, cyclists? So maybe I'll take that for a bit uh, there, uh, Stephanie. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll go back to the map that David had shown. And uh, it, it clearly indicated that we're only allowing parking in certain areas. Uh, so if you think of a bike route, you want to provide a bike route that goes from uh, A to B and not have interruptions throughout the, the area. Uh, putting in a protected bike lane would impede upon the transit usage along the corridor, impact the transit stops. And when you get to Dundurn, uh, given the configuration of that intersection there, you would uh, basically be uh, having those cyclists go back into general purpose lane. So it's not really an appropriate route for uh, cycling uh, to go with protected bike lanes along this route as well. We would have to do a complete reconfiguration of the entire street. Uh, it's not simply adding, uh, taking away that lane and adding the cycling routes there. And that would involve a lot more work uh, in terms of longer term and be quite permanent. So going back to what the uh, councillor had indicated earlier, there is a, a study underway that would identify proper cycling routes through this corridor. Uh, I would say to you that uh, Aberdeen itself is not uh, really uh, conducive to having protected bike lanes on there. It's better to put that kind of cycling facilities on a parallel roadway. Thanks, David. Uh, back to that question I misplaced is, how many serious injuries and fatalities have there been on Aberdeen since the current improvements have been made? Is that basically your only measure of safety on that street? Um, I'll let the engineers speak to this, but I, I did, I think I made a, a point in my letter to the community that safety um, is, is measured in different ways. And it's also the um, aversion of a place because it's not safe. Um, so uh, that message can be passed down from one generation to the other. I know that was a message um, that was passed down to us when we moved in the neighborhood that there were just certain streets you avoided when you had young children. Um, so that in, in it of itself is um, a measure or um, I think a measure of the absence of, of a safe route. But I'll, I'll uh, defer to the experts. I think really uh, the answer that Dave gave before is, is uh, where I'm going to go back to. Uh, you, these kind of measures take time to show up statistically. So we have been implementing uh, various measures over the course of the last number of years. We've seen a decrease in, the, in numbers along the corridor, um, but uh, you have to really let, let those numbers accumulate over a couple of years. So uh, that's why we're doing the before and after study and we'll be evaluating the uh, the effectiveness of the measures as we move forward in uh, next early next year. Thanks. Uh, Greg asks, if the pilot is successful, will the westbound curb lane become a permanent parking lane only? Sorry, do you mean the north or south? 
Could you clarify? So it, would be on the, it would be on the north side of Aberdeen, uh, facing going westbound. Just for think, me. Yeah, Sorry, just asking if the, I guess, if the parking restrictions uh, will re remain in place after the pilot's uh, finished. And um, I would say at this point, um, yes, that, that's kind of uh, uh, what we would be looking at. If it is successful, obviously those, implement, those uh, uh, changes worked and uh, they would be made uh, essentially permanent. Thanks. From Jane, what happens at rush hour when people will need to turn left onto side streets going either way, east or west? There will be a massive backup of traffic waiting for the vehicle to turn. I suggest a bike lane on each side or drive line each way and a center turning lane for those turning to get out of the way of through traffic. So how, how will they deal with people who are turning left and right um, and blocking traffic? Yeah, so that, that'll be something that uh, we're identifying as part of our observations and our train movement counts. Uh, to identify if there's issues. If there are issues, then there are items that we could implement. For example, uh, maybe you add in some restrictions in the area of the intersection on the opposite side of the roadway uh, so that vehicles could get around a left turning vehicle if need be. So that'll be all identified through our observations. Okay. This is from Mark. How is it safer with drivers entering parked vehicles with high volumes of traffic? That this, this situation is no different than any other street that we would have parking on the road itself. Uh, there are many streets where we have parking on the side of the, side of the road. We even have parking on, on Main and King, and uh, that's, that's a, a similar operation as it would be here. Question from Trisha. Is Rousseau a valid example? It's not congested because there are only two traffic lights between the 403 and Wilson, while there are seven between the 403 and Queen. So is she basically, do you feel like you're, you're adequately comparing locations um, when one has only two lights and one has seven? Yes, so I think uh, we need to go back to what is it that we're actually implementing here. We're implementing uh, the parking, uh, allowing parking in the section that is between uh, Queen and Dundurn. And we're not impacting the section that's uh, further to the west. And there is a, a you know a less amount of uh, traffic signals in this area. The volumes that are in Russo are actually, I believe, higher than uh, on Aberdeen in this area here. So it is very similar in terms of, of nature. I would say that um, uh, the uh, neighborhoods may have, be a little bit different because the one's coming off the highway directly uh, on Russo, but uh, generally they are very similar. All right, from Beatrice, she's trying to understand uh, how this started. Um, so it was the neighborhood association and residents via the ward council that made these requests and then staff made recommendations based on this request. What was that? What started this out and chicken, this is a chicken and egg thing. How did this begin? Maureen, you're on mute. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll answer it. Um, this request for um, an address to Aberdeen started as early as 2015. Um, and um, the conversation um, grew. And then uh, the Ward 1 counselor uh, was involved. And, and then once that becomes involved, then the staff become involved. And then it's assessed and um, studied. And then um, if it's deemed to warrant any action, then it gets on the docket uh, formally in a committee of council. Not sure that answers your question, but. Now I'm on mute. How will the success <laughs> of the pilot project be determined and are there any specific timelines? Um, I think there are. I think I heard David say, um, that there is um, an assessment 
part of it will be formalized uh, in the spring, but I'll, I'll let him, of course, speak to that. Yeah, as, as per the direction of council, uh, we are required to report back uh, to Public Works Committee in one year. Um, so based on our studies, our observations, uh, what we determine uh, to be whether it's successful. So we, we follow our policies such as transportation master plan uh, and level of service that is considered acceptable. Um, and based on our evaluation, we will make a recommendation in terms of uh, possible improvements to move forward with um, and leave that to council to, to support. Okay, thanks. Um, can you speak to the traffic models that were conducted? Can Aberdeen, as one lane in each direction, handle the AD, AADT? I don't know what that is. I'm sorry, I'm sure you do. But what traffic models were conducted? And can they handle the AADT? Yeah, so our, our signal systems group undertook uh, an evaluation um, using a computer program uh, to determine what the impact would be from going down from uh, four lanes to two lanes uh, based on their comments uh, that they can be accommodated. Uh, it will still be uh, within the um, acceptable level of service uh, as identified in the transportation master plan. I think there's a couple of locations where it's identified as a level of service D. Uh, so those locations our signal systems group will be uh, paying close attention to, making modifications um, to those uh, signal timings at those locations uh, as we implement the program. <clears throat> and again, as, as we talked about earlier, um, it still operates as a four lane road and is dependent on parking. So um, if there are areas where uh, we identify issues, may I have to add some additional parking restrictions uh, to improve at an intersection. But as I mentioned, you know, at Dundurn, for example, the, the existing configuration stays the same. So, um, but we'll continue to monitor that signal systems feels that it can be accommodated uh, as recommended. Are those studies available publicly? And where would they be if they are? Uh, I don't, I, I believe they were in one of the reports. I believe we talked about level of service and maybe uh, timing delays or existing runs. Um, so I, I believe that is available. All right, I'm pretty sure that we put some of them up on the website, but we can um, point to all the reports that were presented yes, to Council. So Stephanie, maybe may if I could just take that question for yep. a second. Uh, we will be providing a before and after uh, evaluation to Council once that work is undertaken in April, and that will clearly identify that the uh, levels of service and the travel times through the corridors uh, before, which the, the data we collected last year, and then the data we collect in April. So they'll provide a very fulsome comparison uh, once the uh, pilot is ended. Thank you. Uh, what about the safety implications of kids crossing from between parked cars on Aberdeen or other side streets with increased traffic? Yeah, I mean, from, from a road safety perspective, um, no pedestrian should really be, should be crossing. crossing between uh, vehicles at, at a non-controlled location. I mean, obviously, that's why we have the additional crossings at Cottage and Kent, um, as well as the other major intersections. Um, so that concern is an issue on any roadway uh, within the city um, and is not encouraged. I, th I think maybe Dave, you can speak to currently if um, someone wanted to cross outside of those um, designated crossings, they're, they're crossing four lanes of traffic. And uh, you know, once parking is in there, perhaps they're only uh, crossing two lanes of traffic and then um, um, you know, it, it's a matter of, uh, of uh, safety in that case. But like you said, 
um, crossing at the designated crossings are in is the safest uh, option for everyone. Thanks. For Miles, have any environmental studies been done on the impact of slower traffic speeds on residents in terms of idling car pollution that will be detrimental to the health of kids walking along Aberdeen? I, I, you can answer that. I, yeah, I, I can. I can try. Or I'll let Edward go, and then I, I can um, try and respond to that. I think we have to remember that uh, this is uh, going to be a uh, either a similar amount of uh, vehicles traveling along this corridor, or potentially less now that we've opened up the Queen Street uh, access to going up to King and, and in the future up to Maine. And uh, slower speeds actually reduce the amount of emissions that you have uh, coming out of a car versus uh, speeding cars. So, uh, you know, we haven't done any environmental modeling here, and not necessarily to do that, given that uh, we know that. Uh, that there will be a very uh, negligible change in terms of the emissions. Question for Rhoda. Um, if Aberdeen is reduced to one way in each direction, will the advanced left turn green lights be on all day at both Dundurn and Lock? Will the length of time of the advanced greens be extended? Currently at Lock, only two cars can turn left on the advanced green. Sorry, is the just so I can, I might want to make sure I didn't mishear that um, because I know there are advanced screens there now in practice. So the question is, will they be elongated? Will they be elongated? And will they, how, how much, did they run 24 seven? Do they run from 5.30 AM till 12 PM? When, when do they run and will they be elongated to uh, allow for that single lane of traffic at those locations? Yeah, and that's something, as I mentioned before, is all part of that evaluation by our signal systems team. Uh, they will evaluate and implement changes um, based on what they're seeing on the roadway. Um, so what they really do is they, they try to balance out um, the timings and the right of way for the various directions and try not to have a, a major a negative impact on any one specific direction. But They'll, they'll be modeling that and, and watching that uh, as the changes get implemented. From Graham, what modeling has the city done on the eastbound right turn from Aberdeen to Queen Street South for rush hour? In the Duran neighborhood? No, nope. this would be going, going eastbound. Okay. Okay, um, there is a right turn only uh, to go up the Queen Street Hill or you oh. can, and then there, on the other side, of course, you can go left or straight into Durant. Graham is wondering what kind of modeling has the city done on that eastbound right turn? That, that movement is not changing through the course of this work. There's still going to be that uh, right turn movement, so that hasn't changed at all. It would have been reviewed as part of the overall level of service analysis, but uh, there's no change to that movement. Um, Susan is asking about uh, how this will affect those with uh, physical challenges. Um, how will DART users access um, their patrons? Uh, are there any other considerations for people with disabilities um, that this may um, put them at jeopardy? I'll, I'll let the other folks um, respond to that, but I, I guess I would say if you're making um, the pedestrian journey safer, it will be, of course, that buffer of space and time. It will be also safer for people who um, uh, require some sort of mo mobility device. Yeah, so, so one of the things that was identified in that Kirkendall report uh, was the um, uh, unsafe feeling for uh, pedestrians walking along that corridor um, because there there is a narrow sidewalk um, and you have a traffic a, a live uh, traffic lane right next to the sidewalk so for a, a person with mobility issues uh, this would provide a better uh, experience for them in terms of, of going along the corridor um, yeah yeah, I think that's, that's the biggest point to it. 
There is nothing to reduce speeds between a Aberdeen and Studholm. Uh, what, why is that? What can be done to help the folks at that end of Aberdeen? Yeah, so through this uh, direction of council, it was a focus on this piece between uh, Queen and uh, Dundurn. Uh, I know the uh, western portion has, has also uh, come up, um, but uh, the direction for this at this time was just to focus between Queen and Dundurn. Thank you. How will you manage snow removal if the cars are parked? Uh, Steph, I'll take that one. That's that's simple. It's uh, we'll deal with snow the same way we deal with any other street that we have parking on. If the cars are parked and uh, we have to go around them, we will, and we'll have to send back a crew to, to clean the snow uh, once that vehicle is removed. So uh, we deal with it on over 3,000 kilometers of roadways within the city in a similar manner. Thank you. Um, why has Aberdeen not been considered for a photo radar pilot? This seems like the best solution. Yes, yeah, so one of the biggest issues there is, uh, as you know, we have an extended uh, 40 kilometer uh, school zone area with flashers. Uh, automated speed enforcement is currently not permitted for use uh, within uh, area with a reduced speed limit that is controlled by flashers. Uh, the province is coming forward with uh, changes uh, to the Highway Traffic Act, uh, which would see some modifications uh, with respect to the school zones and the removal of uh, flashers. Um, but until that takes place, uh, we're unable to implement uh, automated speed enforcement within that area. <clears throat> what about reducing speed limit to 45, reinforcing it with electronic surveillance, which we just talked about? That's a whole other um, and can't be done at this time. Um, and people are wondering, there's a number of people wondering why the Hamilton Police Services cannot be on site um, to enforce speed um, as a solution to uh, the traffic and speeding problems on that street. So, so uh, maybe I'll jump in here. The Hamilton Police Services uh, does go around and um, enforce speeding uh, on all our roadways, but they do have limited resources. They can't be everywhere uh, at all times. Uh, we have requests by the hundreds for them to come out and do speed enforcement on various streets. The uh, automated speed enforcement is another tool that we're uh, piloting right now and rolling out. Hopefully in the future, that'll be uh, something that we can help uh, reduce the demands on the Hamilton Police Service. But at the, at the present time, uh, there's only so many resources. They can't sit there 24 seven to deal with the speeding. So if additional changes are found to be untenable due to traffic congestion and increased cut through traffic into residential streets endangering pedestrians, would the city consider reinstating the original four lanes with no courtesy parking without further delay? So, so this is a pilot, and, and once we uh, have done the pilot and done the evaluation, we're going back to council, and at that point, council can decide if uh, the, the pilot will continue as a permanent or if they want to um, go back and revert the uh, parking to the way it was. Right. Alan is asking if Rousseau is truly, is also asking is truly as comparison, but you did respond to that earlier saying that you felt it was, even though it has a certain uh, center turning lane and no parking. Um, did you want to expand on that further or do you feel you answered that previously, Edward? Uh, Rousseau is going to be undergoing as well uh, changes in the future. It is, um, there's an environmental assessment that was completed for it, but I, I do believe that is a good, good, good comparison. Is there concern about emergency vehicles getting through with, with the parking in place? No concerns with whatsoever. Okay. Uh, to clarify, this is a if the pilot is successful, is there a chance that the westbound curb lane? Okay, this is back to the same question we had before. It's just worded a little different. Chance that that what that 
westbound north side curb lane will become a designated parking lane only so that traffic could not drive through that curb lane if no vehicles were there does that make sense now um so that, that really can't happen uh you can always drive on the roadway if there's no parking there if there's no one actually parked there, it's a roadway. So if there's someone parked, that'll block you from going there, but uh, we don't designate roadways so people cannot drive in them. Uh, you would actually have to physically make changes to the roadway that would prevent someone from going through. Uh, back to will parking be allowed during specified times? And the answer to that is it is allowed 24 seven during that period of time, is that correct? Correct. Except for uh, west of Dundurn, which is not in scope of this necessarily this discussion, but that will remain the same as it is now, which is available 24 seven with the exception of, I believe, seven to nine in the morning. That's right. west, west of Dundurn, okay. Right. Where is most of the traffic going on Aberdeen? So, so I, I think uh, it's fair to say that there is um, quite a bit of traffic that comes off of the uh, Beckett Drive there and, the, um, you know, the, the access from the mountain. There is uh, traffic that goes along Queen. There's traffic that might turn down Lock to access the businesses there. There's uh, traffic that will go down Dundurn, uh, utilize that route, and there is some traffic that will head out towards uh, Longwoods as well as the uh, the 403. So, it is, it is spread out. Um, there's quite a bit of traffic that uh, would probably head out to McMaster as well. So it, it, isn't, it is a lot of non-neighborhood driven traffic here. Um, someone is uh, bringing up an example where this was done elsewhere. Um, I don't believe there's rat running or cut through traffic on, off Kenilworth where this was implemented. Can the staff comment on that project and the success of that? I'll, I'll let Dave and, and uh, maybe speak to this as well, but uh, Kenilworth was a, was a highly successful uh, road diet where uh, it was championed by the local councillor, uh, allowed for parking in that area. Uh, over time, people get a, uh, accustomed to it. And even though they had very he heavy traffic along that section, uh, it works quite well right now. Um, it's just a matter of people uh, changing their expectations in terms of how quickly they might have to be, uh, how quickly they'll go through that corridor. Uh, there really isn't any uh, rat running uh, along up uh, Kenilworth, uh, even though there is a very, um, um, I guess, uh, def well-defined uh, grid network down there. Um, this goes back to enforcement, Marie. Maybe you can speak to this based on the conversations we've had with HPS in the past mm -hmm. two years. Yep. Um, most people are saying they've seen no real enforcement by HPS on Aberdeen or within mm -hmm. the neighborhood as a whole, um, and they're wondering why that is. Um, and that would help explain perhaps why we are moving to a design rather than relying on enforcement. Yeah, there is um, there is a, a regrettably uh, the resources just aren't there in terms of where they're allocated. I do know um, in the 2020 budget submission by the Hamilton Police Service, um, in, in recognition of the concern of uh, speed um, and the danger it presents um, and the issue of distracted driving, um, the Hamilton Police Service uh, created a, have created a newly uh, traffic enforcement unit with eight officers, but again, um, that's for 15 wards throughout the city. Um, and we just, the resources aren't there to provide for, um, I think the level of enforcement that most folks would hope would be there um, on a daily basis in order to change behavior because it has to be there constantly in order to um, quickly, almost like kick a habit of, of speed. Um, and it's just not possible. So that's why, um, in terms of Vision Zero, enforcement is one E, um, engineering or re-engineering is another, education is one, and certainly engagement is another. So it, it's not just going to be one thing. 
just going to, if you'll bear with me, pivot to some questions that came earlier um, that, that people um, sent in advance to try mm -hmm. to be helpful. Um, yep. Just watching the hour. Uh, yeah, stuff. I know. It's just, we had a, it's a lot of questions there. Mm -hmm. I understand safety of pedestrians, including children, along Aberdeen is the concern. We know that they are currently backups both east and west along the stretch during rush hours, and moving to two lanes will frustrate this traffic more, which will then take people onto residential streets to bypass the blockage. How will this move make the whole neighbor safer, safer for pedestrians, particularly in the light of the Vision Zero strategy? So I, I know David um, spoke to the fact that it's a pilot, uh, that they have their points of reference will they, where they will be measuring, but I'll, I'll let him speak to that again if you would like or anybody else. Yeah, so uh, as mentioned, you know, we're gonna continue to, to monitor um, from the Vision Zero perspective. Obviously, if vehicles are parked there, they're providing a buffer, so it's providing a better environment for uh, all pedestrians, all road users along the sidewalk. Uh, if we are monitoring the uh, side streets or local neighborhood roads, and as I said, identifying an issue, uh, we will take corrective action on that and identify uh, countermeasures that could be implemented to address those issues. Uh, to ensure we're still meeting our Vision Zero needs. The goal of lane reduction is traffic calming to slow traffic down. However, is it correct that the city's own traffic calculations anticipate much more congestion once the lane reduction comes into effect with the volume to capacity ratio, ratio on Aberdeen at Dundurn and Lock Streets, for example, nearly doubling the peak AM hours? Yeah, so based on the analysis conducted uh, by our signal system staff, so they, they identified it through a worst case scenario. Um, I know there was reference about uh, the, the biggest difference uh, in the numbers in terms of queue lengths. Um, so they went based on identifying what the biggest uh, issue that they expect could be, and that's called the 95th percentile queue. Um, in talking with the signal systems uh, uh, senior project manager, he was uh, saying that it's more realistic uh, to utilize a 50% uh, queue length. So if, you know, if it was identified that it was going to be, you know, let's say 300 meters, then he says it's m probably more appropriate that you'd be looking at 150 meters. So mm -hmm. you've gone from 50 meters up to 150 meters instead. And again, as we talked to earlier, uh, the signal systems group will be monitoring uh, and implementing signal changes, signal timing changes uh, as needed. Um, can you just explain the queue bit a little bit uh, more in more detail, what you mean by queue and um, level of service along Aberdeen, for example, the queue at Dundurn is expected to be 26 to 291 and locked from five to 270. What does that really mean? Right, so using the, the 26 to 291. <clears throat> so what that says, so currently it's, it's approximately 26 meters a queue length. So that's the length uh, of space that vehicles are uh, lining up at the intersection. What they're saying is as part of the, the 95th percentile queue that it could extend to 296. However, as I just discussed, <clears throat> the senior project manager suggested that the 50th, 50th percentile queue length is probably more appropriate. So you're looking at 150 meters. Um, in terms of level of service, so level of service is uh, a traffic industry um, terminology uh, that identifies how a intersection operates as well as a corridor. And it goes from A to F. Um, as part of our uh, train station master plan, I believe it is, it's identified that uh, the city will operate uh, at a level of service D or better. That's the ultimate goal. So when we do these evaluations, we want to make sure that if we're implementing changes, we're not dropping below that level of service D. And so <clears throat> based on the evaluation conducted by signal systems, 
is that it can be accommodated without going below uh, that level of service. Maureen, why, and maybe uh, actually Maureen and Edward, why was there no or very little public consultation about lane restrictions, rain, lane reductions? Well, I guess I would answer that in the following way. Um, and I, my opening remarks were this has been part of a community conversation um, which predates me uh, and began as early, if not earlier, formally since 2015. And this is part of a council direction. And it's that continuous looping back um, to try and implement and improve upon and move forward. I know I, as part of the Ward 1 office, we use um, multiple platforms um, in which to try and uh, reach out to people, uh, social media, um, a newsletter, um, our um, website. So that's the way I would respond to that. Are there any and, and Sorry, and it's also part of the, the sorry, Steph, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's also part of uh, the council deliberation is a, is a public process and um, a democratic public process, and it was deliberated there as well. Great. Uh, are there any plans for detouring traffic on the, off the highway in the event of a highway closure? So, so uh, Steph, I'll answer that. Uh, the city does have a uh, emergency detour route plan uh, that we implement once uh, there is um, closures on the 403. Uh, Aberdeen uh, and along this section is not part of that detour route. Uh, the city uses other, other roadways as part of the EDR. So I know that's come up in the paper, but uh, the only section of Aberdeen that is uh, part of the detour route, the, the formally approved detour route uh, is actually Aberdeen up to Longwoods and then the traffic is um, diverted from there. Uh, going back to the queue idea, there's two pieces to this question. One is, can you speak to the queue in terms of time and not meters to help people understand what that might mean? Um, so, 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 Steph, I, I yeah. think that's an that's an excellent question, actually, because uh, people don't really understand um, the meters. And what what I'd like to to break this down to is, it's really simple. How long does it take for you to get through this corridor? And uh, right now. Uh, when we look at this corridor, uh, having analyzed it, uh, it takes, uh, in, in, for, for the most part, looking at some of the numbers that we've looked at, it takes anywhere from four to five minutes for people to travel through this corridor. Uh, once we've done uh, implementing the parking, it's going to take between five and six minutes. So what we're really talking about here is potentially one or two extra minutes of getting through the corridor. And then this really does also uh, relate to this question related to rat running. Um, think about it from a human nature perspective. If you know you might take an extra 60 seconds to go through this corridor, are you really going to go off of this corridor into some of the side streets? It'll take you far longer to go through the side streets, through all the stop signs and all the other roadways there to get to your destination than it will to for you to just stay on Aberdeen. So it doesn't, it, there really is a, uh, not a large impact in terms of travel time going through the corridor. Thank you. Uh, since this is an experiment, will you assess the traffic changes on Queen's configuration before making the number of lane changes on Aberdeen? The, the council direction was uh, that the changes to Aberdeen be done. Um, upon the completion of the conversion of Queen. Uh, formal EDR is different than the real EDR that is followed. People come along Aberdeen to turn onto Dundurn to go to York to rejoin the highway. So the point being that, you know, nobody's following the rules. All right. Um, in terms of queuing, uh, Mr. Ferguson appears to be telling us that at 50%, queuing, the queues will be much longer than they currently are. How does this increase safety? So they, yeah, so I mean a, a congestion situation, um, obviously you're, you're into slower speeds uh, because people aren't able to move as quickly. So if incidents do occur, 
they are occurring at that lower rate of speed. Therefore, uh, the percentages greatly decline in terms of injury potential. Tricia, how is it that the city is implementing the lane reduction as a traffic calming measure on an arterial road when the city's traffic calming policy states that such measures are not suitable for arterial roads because the purpose of such roads is to move traffic efficiently, efficiently to reduce the amount of traffic and speeds on the lower classification streets? Yeah, I think overall, when it comes to traffic calming measures, uh, the reference is made to sort of these physical features such as uh, speed cushions, speed humps. We get a lot of requests for implementing those on these types of roadways, which we will not do. Um, secondly, or is the new policies uh, that have come forward and approved by council uh, related to complete streets, division zero, uh, the transportation master plan, <clears throat> they are more accommodating for implementing uh, these types of changes on, on these types of, of roadways. And we've seen that implemented throughout the city at various locations. And I think if you could wrap up with just really telling us about um, how people can feel safe on the side streets, how you're going to measure um, the cut through traffic that may occur initially as people get accustomed to what's going on. Um, I think that's one of the biggest concerns as I read through a number of the questions that were submitted previously and online. How can they feel that they're going to be safe on their residential, their, their residential street compared to um, what they are now? How are you guys going to address that quickly and in a manner that uh, gives people a sense of, of, of relief? Yeah, and then there's a couple of things there, really, and Edward touched on it earlier. Uh, it, the Kenilworth uh, project, for example, exact same scenario, four-lane roadway, um, same types of concerns were brought forward. Um, the neighborhood layout is very similar in terms of uh, the path or the, the, the sort of the, the road configuration. Um, you know, concerns with going down to one lane and allowing parking and as Edward mentioned, it was a, a great success. Um, we didn't have any issues. We had no cut through uh, occurring. Um, the councillors actually just brought forward a motion to uh, implement permanent features uh, to provide parking. Um, and again, in this scenario, um, like I mentioned, we, we will be conducting studies. We will be doing observations. Uh, if a resident in those neighborhoods has any concerns, uh, if they identify something, um, they can through either through Councillor Wilson's office or contact me directly uh, through email or through phone. And uh, we will make sure that we review those locations and address those concerns. Okay. Thanks, David. And one final question. Can you or someone else answer which, in their opinion, is more if, a more effective method of controlling speed, road design or enforcement? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. And it really goes back to uh, Vision Zero, end of the day. Uh, what we're trying to implement here is a safe systems approach to uh, um, having, uh, you know, road safety. And in, in Vision Zero, the safe systems approach really is based on a number of things. It's based on having safe roads, safe speeds, safe drivers, and safe vehicles. Um, enforcement is a tool. Education is a tool. Um, but the main thing, the number one thing that we have to focus on is how we design our roadways. That's really the, the highest, we have to place the highest priority on safe roads to design the roadways themselves because safe roads are designed to reduce the risk of crashes occurring and the severity of, of injuries if those crashes do uh, actually occur. So we put in safety measures into the road design from the beginning. Uh, and that's really the important part. If we don't design, if we design a roadway so people cannot speed, that's a lot more effective than having enforcement after the fact on a roadway where we allow people to speed. Thank you, Stephanie, for um, reading those questions out for us very much. Um, that is the end of our evening. Uh, we went well over time, but I believe it was time well spent um, because we wanted to get to um, 
each type of question, and uh, I trust that we did that tonight. Um, my understanding uh, from Steph is that this is on the YouTube, so you can watch it at your your leisure, or um, if you wanted to share it with some of your neighbors who are not able to join us tonight, uh, that's at your disposal. Please feel free to do that. Um, thank you very much to everyone who um, took the time to join us. I know we all share a great concern and love for Kirkendall and all of Ward 4. Um, and I, I know we all want the same thing, and that's to be a safe place to to live, um, to work, and to play, to raise our children and our grandchildren. So I appreciate your time and your attention on this beautiful evening in the, on the 1st of September. I also would like to thank um, all of the staff who took the time uh, to share their insights and expertise with us tonight and to walk through all these very uh, good questions. So thank you all and again, um, please feel free to contact me um, at any time if uh, you needed further clarity on any of these matters. And I'll try and help you the best I, that I can. And I will be here all the time uh, listening and um, watching for how this all unrolls. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>